Welcome everyone to the Data Science Hangout and welcome back to many of you who have joined us here in the following uh, past few weeks. Um, but just for anyone who's new to this and to Joel, thank you so much for joining us. This is an open space for current and aspiring data science leaders to just be able to connect and ask each other questions. And really to, uh, today, Joel, we're excited to be able to pick your brain a little bit. Um, and so for the sessions, we really wanna focus on any questions that are most important to you all here. So you can jump in live or put questions in the chat. And we also have a Slido link, um, which Rob will put in the chat window right now. So you can ask anonymous questions there too. Um, but just a little heads up that it will be recorded for people that missed it. So it'll be shared up to YouTube, um, but you always have that option of anonymous questions as well. Um, but I'm so grateful to be joined by my co-host for today, uh, Joel Peppera, the Director of Data Science at GEICO. And Joel, I'd love to have you introduce yourself and maybe share a bit about your team and the work that you do. Sure, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to everyone today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, uh, I am the Director of Data Science at GEICO. Um, pretty much all of the data science activities uh, roll up through me. We do have other analytics teams and professionals scattered throughout other parts of the organization, but uh, all of the core data science work that we do uh, falls under my purview. Um, I've been at GEICO for quite a long time, uh, coming up on 14 years. Uh, my professional background is primarily in the actuarial space. So I'm a credentialed actuary, um, which is an insurance specific profession um, that deals with a lot of things that are, uh, let's say, similar to data science. So using data and predictive analytics and statistics to you know, estimate things, predict um, values of interest. And in insurance, it's primarily uh, assessing uh, customer risk uh, so that we can understand that from a pricing and uh, financial planning perspective. Um, so that's what I did for most of my early career. And then about three or four years ago, um, pivoted into a broader data science role uh, and we've been building up our team and our capabilities within GEICO uh, pretty uh, aggressively. Um, at GEICO, we focus on three main areas of impact for data science. Uh, one is in our product development area. Uh, the second is in our customer experience, dealing with how we interact with uh, customers in marketing channels, customer service channels, et cetera. And then the third major area is our claims division, uh, which deals with how we assess damages and injuries uh, when people are involved in auto accidents. Um, there's a lot of interesting use cases there around fraud detection or you know, triaging, estimating uh, payment amounts and, and things like that. Um, so use cases, uh, I think uh, dealing with data and statistics is not new, but um, certainly a lot of the, um, the technological evolution uh, going on, not just in insurance, but, but more broadly is um, causing us to think a little bit differently uh, about things than we have in the past and uh, opens up a lot of really exciting opportunities for us to uh, mature and, and move forward as, as, a, as a company. Uh, one of the primary areas that I'm most excited about right now is, um, uh, is telematics, um, which for those who aren't familiar is um, it's an initiative within insurance and other industries as well where uh, due to you know, the technology on modern smartphones or increasingly technology embedded in vehicles directly, we can, uh, you know, with the customer's consent, of course, um, uh, understand in a very detailed, granular way how our customers or potential customers are operating their vehicle and um, get a, a much uh, more granular assessment of, of the risk profile. So that's something that I think uh, in general is a, is a big focus for companies in auto insurance and, and certainly Geico is among them. So um, there's a lot of really exciting potential for data science in that domain in particular. That's awesome. And so it, the team's just starting now to use telemat telematics or how are you starting to do this today? Uh, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say we're starting. We've, we've been working with this for a, a little bit now. Um, it, it's not... I think a new phenomenon in insurance. Uh, some companies have been, uh, at least in an R and D capacity, been been working on this for for several years. Um, but I think 
several market factors are increasing the focus. Uh, one is just the technology is changing. Um, you know, smartphones are obviously ubiquitous now, and um, that provides a cost-effective way of collecting data. I also think that um, consumer attitudes around privacy and sharing data are evolving. Of course, there are still concerns, and that, that will continue to be a factor. But you know, I, I really think the pandemic has impacted that in, in some meaningful ways. Um, you know, obviously, when lockdown started occurring, uh, people's driving behavior changed, and, and therefore their, their risk exposure changed. And you know, one of the things we saw was people were realizing, you know, my insurance rates aren't as responsive as maybe they ought to be to how you know, my use of my vehicle is changing. Um, and you saw a lot of companies do some, um, some large scale measures you know, to, to provide people discounts or, or, or uh, refund premiums and things like that. But um, I think it's also you know, pointing to an opportunity to just have a pricing model that is in general more responsive to how people are operating their vehicle. And you know, that kind of creates a value proposition uh, that I think more people are, are comfortable with um, in terms of exchanging you know, some of their data for, for that value. And how, how does the team, or I'm just curious myself, how does the team get all of that data? Or it seems like there's so many different streams of data that would be coming in. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so you pretty much have to have a cloud-based approach here. We're talking about um, sensor level data, it's, it's very large volumes and we're talking petabyte scale. Um, it really kind of depends on how many customers and, and what your enrollment rates look like. But for us, it's, it's very large. Um, uh, so it's, it's a significant data engineering effort to uh, collect that data, curate it, um, make it ready for you know, applying models, training and, and, uh, and inferencing on those uh, those data feeds. So it's, it's a big, big effort. Um, I would say it's at least as big on the data engineering side as it is on the data science and uh, machine learning side. So those, those two things go hand in hand. I mean, I think that's true in general with data science, but in particular, um, at the scale we're talking, that's a critical consideration. Definitely. I'm starting to see a few questions coming in from the audience. And Chris, I see you just asked one in the chat. Do you want to ask that live and introduce yourself? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Chris Scheibel. Uh, I have been doing uh, data analytics for the past uh, 24 years, uh, active duty military, retired, and now got myself slid into a data science role. So uh, some of the things that uh, I'm trying to get more uh, collective on besides all the statistical stuff in that is understanding more of the, the tools that my fellow data scientists out there that are using, besides the fact of, you know, things like Python, Pandas. Um, I know our studio is a big thing. I'm currently working on uh, Shiny applications where I'm at as well, but I was just, just kind of curious as far as maybe some of the other tools out there that, that folks are using that I might be able to, to dive into and utilize. Yeah, good question. I, I think you uh, you listed off a lot of the, the key ones. Um, you know, from a certainly from a machine learning uh, model training uh, perspective, R and Python are kind of the, the core languages. Um, our team, I, I would say, mostly develops in Python, but there are some uh, some users in Geico that are heavy R users as well. Um, so both of those, I think, are are great languages to learn. Um, you know, sort of the dirty secret, although I, I don't think it's a secret anymore about data science, is you spend a lot of your time in data preparation. Um, so I think the more adept you are with languages like SQL or um, Spark is a big one that we use a lot just based on the, the scale of our data. Um, so learning uh, languages um, like uh, Scala uh, or, you know, the SQL interface into Spark, we, we often use uh, PySpark pretty heavily. So, um, you know, there are different interfaces in the Spark, but just being comfortable with optimizing data processing jobs uh, in a distributed setting, I think is a, is a good investment of time. Um, for us, it's, it's mainly a combination of Spark and Python uh, with, with a good, good amount of SQL as well. Um, and then I think a lot of it sort of depends on, you know, beyond that, which I think is the core, a lot of it depends on 
what the role of a data scientist is in a particular company. Um, and that can vary quite a bit. Uh, some of them find themselves more um, involved in some of the low level data engineering where you might wanna familiarize yourself with data ingestion technologies, you know, Kafka or uh, you know, some of the streaming technologies. Uh, some data scientists tend to find themselves getting more um, more involved in the front end development, you know, where they might need to use uh, you know, web development technologies, JavaScript, uh, those sorts of things. So some of that will depend on just where you're situated in the overall kind of uh, development stack. But um, I would say Spark, SQL, and Python and R are kind of the core technologies that I would, I would focus on. Thank you for that insight, Joel. I greatly appreciate that. And now that means I can go ahead and add to my list of things I need to start learning. That's <laughs> good. As a, um, I guess, kind of a follow-up question to that, um, Trevor, I see you're asking around how much time does the team spend doing data analytics versus data science? Trevor, did you want to jump in and add any context there? Good morning. Good morning again, where, I mean, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm just very curious, you know, the, the field of data science continues to evolve. I've seen so many definitions of data science, so many definitions of data analytics. Um, I think the, the conclusion I'm working with in terms of defining data science is more around um, building predictive models. I mean, that's where I see the, the, the literature going towards. So I know that not all the problems that we try to solve in a company can be solved by data science. <laughs> Some of it is actually analyzing basic data, basic descriptions. So I really wanted to find out, most times when I talk to people on data science teams, I really want to find out how much of their time is really spent building, fine tuning, maintaining models as in data science versus trying to answer, answer everyday basic questions. Yeah, That's I think it's a good question. Um, as you mentioned, uh, this can vary quite a bit uh, across different industries or different companies within in the industry. And I think a lot of it depends on the overall maturity of the organization from a uh, sort of data and analytics perspective. Um, at Geico, we have a lot of traditional analytics teams that will apply statistical methods or um, uh, various analytical techniques to derive insights, make recommendations to some of the business consumers, build reports and those sorts of things. Um, so at, at Geico, our data science team uh, tries to focus more on core data science work, which, which I would consider to be, like you mentioned, training predictive models, building machine learning systems, and most of what we do for like large scale systems that can and directly impact business processes through some kind of production implementation. Um, so that I think for us at least is the big difference, the focus on machine learning. Um, I, I think one differentiator I would also draw is um, our data scientists tend to be more comfortable working with lower level data or, or data in different formats. Um, so not just uh, consuming data from databases, but you know, getting into semi-structured, unstructured data, being able to um, curate those views themselves, clean the data, um, manipulate the data, build features out of it. Um, most of the analysts we see uh, tend to be more comfortable uh, consuming data that's already been uh, structured into a database. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing more of the kind of high level analysis on top of it. So that's another distinction I draw. And then I also think that um, the focus on putting code into production is something that data scientists tend to do uh, more so than analysts. So it, you know, building a model, deriving insights from it, building reports is um, important, but there's sort of another level of consideration when you have to think about how a model is going to interact in a production process. You know, wh what data is gonna be available? What's the context of a prediction within a business process? How is the data gonna be fed through that model? Those are some really important and, and, and can be very tricky considerations 
uh, that if you're not building models for production, you don't really have to think about. Um, so that's, that's sort of how I think about the distinction within Geico. That said, um, you know, these terms are fluid across the industry. What I describe in terms of a data scientist at Geico, you know, another company might think of as an ML engineer. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, if you're interviewing for a company or you know, considering different jobs to really understand, you know, what is the role for this person in this company, regardless of what the title is. I feel like this this question of like data analysts or data science seems to come up in a lot of of conversations as well. And I know it might be different for some larger organizations versus like smaller startups. But would data analysts sit on a much different team than than yours, or do you have both data analysts and data scientists? Um, within Geico, they're they're in a different team, but we would work collaborative collaboratively with them. Um, so anytime we take on a, a use case, uh, we would typically identify partners um, on, on a business analyst team, a business process team, um, data engineering, and if there's an application team involved, um, you know, we sort of build these cross-functional teams uh, to address a particular problem. I don't think that's the only model. I think a lot of companies combine them on the same team, and, and we've considered the pros and cons of that uh, as well. Um, so I think a lot of times there's there's fluidity between the roles, um, and especially at smaller companies, I think data scientists are often asked to, to wear many hats. You know, um, just depending on what what that company needs at the time. You know, maybe maybe the best way to help them is by creating a dashboard or you know putting out some basic uh, summary statistics and, and analysis on that. Um, I think a lot of data scientists I've run into and in interviewing in just different settings. Um, kind of get frustrated by that because they, they come into the job, the industry thinking, you know, I'm going to build machine learning models or I'm going to do deep learning. And um, you know, I certainly think it's important to find a role that fits in with what you're looking for. But I would also stress that, especially early in your career, um, being willing to kind of roll your sleeves up and get involved in whatever's needed is, is really critical. And, and you'll, you'll develop a lot of good experience through that as well. So even if you you know find yourself doing a lot of low-level database work and you're not really that's not really what you're looking for long term, you know, I think there's a, a lot of valuable learning to that. So you know I would certainly encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities and and be flexible and and willing to um, contribute value, however uh, you can for the company that you're working with. Definitely. Thank you, Joel. And I'm seeing quite a few anonymous questions coming in as well from Slido and kind of going back to what you were initially talking about, about things that changed during the pandemic and looking more into or when people were driving less. Um, did the pandemic force more data science resources to be put into front facing customer experience initiatives? Um, it's hard for me to say broadly. I don't that was certainly not the case at Geico. Uh, we're a bigger organization, so we have more specialization and teams that kind of focus on uh, those aspects. Um, it, it definitely impacted us to a degree. Um, you know, initiatives that we were working on were maybe steered in a direction that could directly contribute to something more pandemic or rela related. Um, so I think there were some small examples of that, but I, I don't think it was a wholesale redirection of resources within, within our company, at least. Uh, I would strongly suspect that that answer would be different at other companies. Um, I, I think in insurance, we were certainly fortunate to not be as directly impacted as some other companies like um, you know, service industry, for example, hotel industry. That, there were huge impacts for some of those areas, and um, you know, I, I expect the answer would be different for people working there. Thank you. Um, I'll jump back to a few of the anonymous questions in a second here as well, but I see Frank, you weighed in in the chat. Um, would you want to jump in and ask that question live too? It's hard for me not to ask questions, so thank you. Um, Joel, I, you got me really curious talking about uh, data and models and then figuring out how to give safer drivers better rates. It got my mind thinking again about, this is sort of a data governance question. And you could say, you know what, we're only using the data for people that opt in, but sort of automatically by doing that, you're learning about the people that don't opt in. 
And I'm kind of curious, what do you, what is your experience or if you just have any comments or thoughts on um, what I see is sort of a, a moral hazard there? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that's something, you know, I think we had talked about for years as a complicated or a sort of complicating factor for moving forward with telematics. If, if it's a, an opt-in program, you've got some self-selection bias and um, you sort of have to think through whether the economic incentives of that align with your, your business goals. Um, it, I, I guess what, one thing I would say is uh, there are different ways of getting telematics information. Um, and some of them have uh, higher adoption rates, higher opt-in rates than others. So, you know, for example, one source is connected vehicles. And um, people may or may not know this, but you know, when you're at the dealership buying a, a car and you're signing through the million sheets of paper or whatever, one of those is, is in, in all likelihood, opting into some sort of monitoring for, for your driving behavior. You know, it might be bundled in with some kind of entertainment package or, you know, OnStar or Sirius XM or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some ethical uh, considerations there, of course, but that also does kind of um, shape a little bit of, the objectivity or the, the comprehensiveness of the data that you have access to. Um, to the larger question though, I think this honestly just has to, it, it's an evolving picture, right? So initially you'll have some limited adoption and you know your data is biased by that, but um, it's also the population that you're trying to estimate, right? You're, I mean, the, the way you're applying it is the people opting in. So in some sense, that is the most relevant population to analyze. But that will evolve over time um, as there are other incentives for people to kind of join the party and, um, and contribute their data. So I just think you have to keep considering uh, the evolving profile of people that opt in. Um, and, you know, I think the larger point in, in, in this scenario and, and others is making sure that there is a value to the customer so that it feels like a worthwhile trade-off for them. Um, you know, people, millions of people, most everyone has a smartphone these days. Uh, you're giving up a whole lot of data just by owning that smartphone. And, you know, I think some of the smartphone companies have uh, made a lot of progress in, in giving people more control of what information they're giving up, which is important. But, uh, and, and you do see uh, various levels of concern and backlash uh, in particular scenarios where companies are misusing data. But Overall, I think a lot of people feel like they're getting value out of services like Facebook or YouTube, TikTok, whatever. And um, you know, as long as they feel like th there's an equal exchange for what they're giving up, I think people are increasingly getting comfortable with that. Um, I don't know if that was a direct answer to your question, but it, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to consider. But it's an important thing when you're doing practical data science, practical machine learning, kind of think about these second order effects of, um, you know, not only who is opting into this, but what impact does my model have, for example, right? You come in yeah. with some historical data about who buys what products and whatever, you build a recommender system, but that, that system itself is going to be biasing who purchases what products. And, you know, how do you, how do you plan for that bias when you're trying to, um, you know, retrain models or continue to develop them um, and prevent, uh, you know, building echo chambers, for example. So I think it requires a lot of thought, a lot of it's use case specific, but it's a really important consideration for people doing practical um, data science work. Yeah, uh, I think you mentioned second and third order effects. That That's probably the, the more interesting point because I think all of the single applications um, that, that we create and all the models that we're building, we could probably justify each of them individually, right? There's probably always a good reason. And to be honest, the person that's driving 60 miles an hour down my residential street, I hope they're paying way more in car. You, you should actually charge that person more money. But um, right. yeah, it's probably a matter of like uh, the micros are okay, but then you put those all together and you're like, oh man, that's a, now we have a, a moral conundrum that we need to deal with uh, more as an industry or, or society. So I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. I think as a data scientist, you always have to be considering the broader picture. How is my model going to be used? Is that a valid use of the model given what I know about the data that went into it and how it was trained? Um, 
you know, I think there are a lot of pitfalls that you know several people have pointed out in recent years for misapplying models. So it's, it's <laughs> definitely something that data scientists need to be aware of. Um, yeah. Kind of to your point though about you know incentives and making sure people are um, being charged the right amount for how they're driving. I think one of the the, the real true selling points about telematics for insurance pricing is that the user is in control. Um, and that wasn't always the case for traditional characteristics that are used to segment pricing. You know, if, if you don't like the fact that you're paying more because, you know, you're driving 90 miles an hour down the highway, well, you, you can change your behavior and your price will adapt. And um, I think that is a satisfying realization for people as well. If you feel like you have control and you understand why you're paying what you are, um, you know, there's there's sort of a, a feeling of justice with that, I think. Agreed. I've been wearing, uh, I'll publicize the Whoop band for the past few months. So it collects data on my heart rate variability and it's it's awesome. Like I feel like I am with more control over, I don't know, my my whole being. So yeah, I fully agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fitness monitoring is a huge industry. I, I wear a, a Garmin currently, I'm a runner. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, at least for a certain type of person, probably probably a data scientist, there's just a uh, fascination with collecting data on your everyday life and just, you know, analyzing your heart rate or your sleeping patterns or movement and set, et cetera. Um, I actually think that that's one opportunity uh, for, for um, expanding the use of telematics and insurance. You know, um, right now it's mainly seen as a mechanism for giving you a discount, but um, and I think there might be a market for applying some of the similar types of insights that you get from your smartwatch to a driving context um, that would be interesting to people and also potentially help um, coach them on how to develop safer driving habits, both for themselves, but also if you kind of think through like a teenage driver situation, if you as a parent yeah. have um, more information about how your teenage um, children are driving, uh, you can have you know, better conversations with them about encouraging safe habits and things like that. I think about this a lot, like all the data that's out there about maybe from, oh, there goes your lights, <laughs> from I'm like signing it. up from every potential discount on every website or like a, even an electric toothbrush is like Bluetooth enabled. I'm like, do I really need that on the toothbrush? But, but <laughs> um, maybe shifting gears a Maybe shifting gears a little bit, I see there's a question that came in around, um, does Geico IT centrally service all data scientists across departments and locations, or do you have siloed development in each group? Um, I think it somewhat varies based on um, what you mean by IT. Um, so we, we have different domains within Geico. I mentioned kind of the three core ones, claims, product, and, and customer experience. Um, from a customer interaction standpoint, and what we think of as our front end applications that deal directly with the customer, those are um, segmented teams that sort of own their applications. Uh, when it comes to more of the back end development, like data engineering, um, cloud infrastructure, and that those sorts of components, those are more centralized. And we work with, you know, the same team that kind of serves the needs across those different domains. So it kind of depends on, you know, what part of the data science pipeline we're dealing with. And I guess kind of on a similar uh, related thread, there's an anonymous question on, do you need a big budget to support data science properly? Boy, uh, <laughs> depends on what you mean by big budget. And I guess what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, this is being recorded, don't lie. <laughs> uh, for what we're trying to do, I, I would certainly characterize the budget as, as fairly large. Um, you know, data scientists are an in-demand uh, skill set, and uh, you know, you need to be competitive to attract top talent. Um, and then there's also there can be big infrastructure costs, especially when you're talking about you know petabyte scale data, both in terms of storage processing uh, requirements and so forth. So that is definitely a big investment. Um, not every company has the scale of data or the same needs as we do. Um, 
So if you're just trying to gain insights or you know, build higher quality reports, uh, you know, I would think the, the bar to entry is a lot lower. I'm not sure there's a single answer, but yeah, I, I think for me, yes, the, uh, it's a significant budget item. <laughs> <laughs> I see Steve weighing in in the chat. You need the biggest budget. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not untrue. <laughs> it's, it's sure. you know, if you're, if you're a startup and you're not direct and you're not like a direct technology play that like inherently requires machine learning, this is probably not like the best initial investment for you. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a big investment. If you are in that position or maybe comparing like a huge company like Geico and, and building out that data science team to a startup, what do you think that a startup should focus on initially with building out data science? Well, data science really relies on a solid foundation of data engineering. So I would say, you know, if you, if you think data science or machine learning is eventually going to be a big uh, contributor to your bottom line, getting really good at collecting and organizing data is a great place to start because you know, I think some companies who haven't really dealt with that fundamental infrastructure, you know, hear a lot about all the cool things that data scientists are doing and, you know, big technology companies or, you know, internet companies. And they think, oh, I'm just going to hire a bunch of data scientists and I'm going to be able to do all these like really exciting things. And what that often leads to is a frustrated data science team because they find out that you know, the data they need is scattered across dozens of different databases and different environments, different formats. And that's where they end up spending all of their time pre-processing and you know, building databases just before they can even get to uh, delivering insights or building models. So I think thinking through your data architecture and your data strategy early on is, is pretty critical in my view. Could could you maybe define like levels of data science maturity for companies? Ah, it's a good question. Um, I would say probably the level one is you know, you've got one, maybe a couple of data scientists and, and you're really just looking for them to derive insights. This is probably a company that um, doesn't have a lot of existing analytics support. You know, uh, they're, they're making decisions based on experience or domain knowledge or you know, things like that. And they really don't have a data-driven approach at all. And so they hire a data scientist and they say, well, you know, what, what, what does the data say about the decisions I'm trying to make? How, how could I uh, improve upon you know, a very heuristic-based decision-making process? And there, I think you know, the bar is pretty low. You can use a basic data set, some pretty basic um, modeling techniques and probably improve upon what they're doing. Um, and from there, I mean, there's the sort of almost infinite stages in between all the way up to, you know, these, these very big machine learning driven where they've got you know, hundreds of models that are running that determine pretty much every aspect of how the customer is interacting uh, with their systems, you know, from recommender systems to fraud detection to, uh, you know, all kinds of personalization opportunities. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at the chat with the countably infinite versus uncountable infinite stages. Fun fact, when, uh, when I was uh, doing my graduate work, I actually uh, studied mathematical logic and set theory. So uh, I could speak uh, at length about that question in particular, but that's probably not as relevant to uh, the conversation. But um, I, anyway, to, to the original question and the point, I think there's just a, uh, a huge spectrum in between and it really depends on what the business goals are data maturity and so forth. Um, I would say Geico is somewhere in between those two extremes, you know, um, probably further toward the, the mature uh, data science organization, um, but, uh, you know, probably not as, as mature as a company like Netflix or Amazon or Uber or something like that. Thank you. And uh, apologies, was my internet cutting out for just a second, but it, there was a slight delay there. Um, 
but I see that Trevor, you asked a great question in the chat as well. Come on in, Trevor. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So, so. <laughs> sorry, it was my internet there. It gave me the unstable notice. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. Um, this question is a really, really, really important question to me because the, the models that we build, we don't just build them in a lab, right? They impact lives. <laughs> you know, they impact lives. So, so essentially in this case, the whatever the model predicts is impacting, for example, I'm assuming the rate that someone pays um, for insurance, right? So, so how do you know that your model is actually making the right decision? And so, so that's key for me because I guess I'm from Jamaica. Um, I'm a person of color and I've read many cases where there are models that don't behave as I would want them or how they should. And the impact on people's lives is negative. So I just wanted, you know, some insight into that, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'll answer kind of the general question of, you know, how do you know your models are working? And then, um, you know, I think there was certainly a ethical AI component to your question too, which we can talk about. Um, in general, uh, when you're when you're evaluating a machine learning system, I, I think of three levels of monitoring. Um, one is uh, the sort of infrastructure monitoring, the, the technical system monitoring. You know, uh, this is a piece of software. It's a you know maybe a web service or whatever, and you need to you need to understand um, how that system is performing and making sure that um, you know it's able to handle the volume of requests that are coming into it. Um, that you're not seeing you know large error rates, things like that. So there's a sort of low level technical monitoring that's important. Then there is what I would call statistical monitoring, which is, um, is the model uh, reliably predicting what it was trained to predict? You know, are the, are the distribution of the feature inputs changing over time? Is the distribution of score changing over time? You know, uh, that's, I think, a very important diagnostic to understand, you know, whether it's time to retrain your model because you see drift, um, or, you know, whether there's some change in the population um, that's uh, being scored through your model. Uh, th those are really important. And then there's the third, which I think gets closer to what you're asking about, which is you know, what are the downstream business impacts of the prediction? So, you know, you're predicting whatever it is that you're trying to predict, but then there's often actions that are taken based on that prediction. And typically there are business KPIs or, or maybe other considerations um, that are associated uh, with those actions. And so we would typically set up monitoring uh, for some of those things as well. And I think it's important to have all three levels. Um, to your point about um, you know, how models impact people's lives and you know, how they might disparately impact certain groups over others. I mean, it's a, it's a very important and um, I think a field that's, or, or a topic that's getting a lot of um, consideration uh, over the recent months and years. Um, personally, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Um, I think it requires an investigation of specific use cases, you know, how the model interacts with different groups of people, what is the intended impact versus what the actual impact is. Um, you know, so for example, um, so there's a lot of talk about AI bias and you know, how predictions skew toward one group or another. Um, and you know, one answer might be saying, well, we don't, we don't want there to be any skew across certain demographic groups. Um, but I think, and I understand what's behind that. And I think in some cases that might be the answer, but I also think in some cases that's not really the intent. You know, if you think about, for example, a product recommendation uh, engine and something like gender, I think a lot of people would expect and would want there to be some bias in product recommendations across gender. Um, but in some cases, they, they might have problems with certain recommendations being targeted at one gender or another. So there's some nuance there and it's, it's hard to, to set a global policy that I think covers all cases. Um, so again, I think it's one of those things that a data scientist needs to be aware of. They need to know how their model is going to be used and they need to, ensure that that is consistent with the data that's being fed into it and the methodology that's used to make those predictions. I know in um, 
I think it was a meetup talk with Aetna Insurance. They talked a little bit about, or CVS Health, um, talked about an IBM AI Fairness 360 app that they use. Um, and maybe another one that Google had come out with. Does Geico use something like that internally? Um, we do not use one of those specific model or those specific um, tools. Uh, we do have a process for evaluating the fairness of our models. Yep. Um, don't know that I can get into the specifics of it, yep. but it is certainly something we consider. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. When there, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick as a follow up question. When, when there is discomfort around, let's say, um, targeting a certain segment with a certain product, how does that decision get uh, worked through? I imagine it's the uh, sort of leadership team's responsibility. Yeah, certainly um, uh, leadership is responsible for making the ultimate call there. Um, certainly consult a legal counsel, um, consider the, you know, the business impact, the ethical impact and things like that. So it's, um, you know, we handle those on a model by model basis, uh, but you know, ultimately it's leadership's call. Um, there's quite a few anonymous questions still here. So um, I'm hoping we can go over the time just a little bit here. Um, but one is with a large data science team, how do you balance the needs for structure, like same language, same coding standards, et cetera, versus the needs for speed to produce a result? It's a good question. Um, so the way we approach it, we, I mentioned we had sort of three domains and those more or less operate as autonomous teams, um, but we do coalesce around languages and um, some of the primary tools. Um, I don't really see that as an impairment for speed to, to market or development speed. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't see you know setting up standards around uh, how we're going to structure our data, our our code repositories or. You know, that we're all going to use Python, we're all going to use, um, you know, Databricks as our park de uh, Spark development environment. I don't really see those impediments as impediments to speed. Um, so I'd be curious to know what what the uh, the questioner has in mind or what their experience is in terms of like standards getting in the way of of speed to market. I'm not sure that we'll get uh, additional context just because it was an anonymous question, but. Um... I am curious, so on that first part of the question, so the need for structure, like how do you handle that with teams using R or Python or other languages? Does that matter? Well, I mean, within my team, we're, we're pretty consistent with what tools we use. It's pretty much a Python and Spark shop. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say it probably, so we don't collaborate as directly with some of the other teams in Geico that use R. Um, I suppose that um, down the line, if we wanted to go there, just because you know, the, the code's different. It's, it, I, I don't know that those things aren't overcomable, but it, it would certainly be a little bit, um, a little bit longer to kind of get up to speed on either side uh, because of that like language difference. Um, it's, it's just really not a problem that we've run into so far. Mm -hmm. I know your team mostly uses Python, but I see Ethan just asked a question. Um, if data science teams at Geico use SAS? Hi, Ethan. If it's the Ethan Kang, I'm thinking, uh, I think we uh, have a professional connection in the past. So if, if that's true, uh, nice, nice to uh, speak with you again. But um, uh, to answer your question, no, we, we do not. Uh, when I Ethan. review resumes, we occasionally okay. see that. Um, but I, at least for the candidates that we review, that's sort of becoming a dated language that I don't think a lot of people focus on. And even if you talk to people at SAS, I think they're increasingly looking to support open source languages like R and Python, even within their platform. So it's kind of how I see it. Ethan, did you want to jump in and, and weigh in there? Yeah. Hi, Joe. Nice to see you again. Oh, it is you. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when I was at Kaiko, um, in the actual department, we all use SAS. So I was just curious how, how if they 
if they pass that in Steam, they use SAS as well. But glad you. Yeah, I mean, there are certainly other groups within Geico that use SAS. Um, I think I think as a company, even we're we're starting to move more and more away from that. I mean, you know, you build up code bases over years and years. So I, I don't. It would be difficult to, I think, completely abandon that. But for a lot of the new development we do, certainly within the analytics space, I, it's not centered around SAS. Gotcha. Thank you. Nick, I see you asked a question around sharing data sets. Would you want to weigh in and uh, or jump in and ask that? Sure. I, wor I work for a, um, a company where we don't even share data between divisions, but I was wondering, you know, with, with Geico, you know, being a part of Berkshire Hathaway and, and, and really probably a, an organization that uh, definitely thinks about the different parts of its business. Is there any sharing or anything like that? Or is that even on a roadmap? Um, with like sharing data or maybe just the infrastructure between between different subsidiaries or um, yeah, is it something you all ever talk about? That's a good question. Um, there are some cases where there's uh, sharing of information across Berkshire subsidiaries. So it does happen, but um, by and large, the way Berkshire operates, uh, they leave their subsidiaries largely autonomous and they sort of function as independent companies to a large degree. Um, again, not going to say that there isn't some coordination, but it's really not part of the day to day and uh, not the typical way we operate. So like infrastructure, for example, uh, I don't even know what cloud infrastructure or, or infrastructure otherwise you know, other companies in the Berkshire portfolio use, we, we don't share that across at all. So maybe not as much as you would think, but I mean, honestly, if you kind of look, look at what Warren Buffett and others in the Berkshire circle say, I mean, they, they explicitly acknowledge that they like to keep their part or their subsidiary companies more or less autonomous and, and uh, um, self-sufficient. Similarly to the data that you're using or in sharing it among teams, there was an earlier question on if Geico um, utilizes data from public safety answering points or emergency communications. Uh, public safety. So like, uh, not, not quite sure what we're referring to there. Um, like public service announcements or like, not, not quite sure, public records. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's like, uh, I can only guess what their <laughs> the question is about, but around like 911 records or- Oh, I see. Uh, no, not in general. Uh, I'm actually not totally sure what's available uh, mm -hmm. in that regard or what information we can get. Um, that we, we definitely have access to outside data, um, things like police reports or you know, public records data that, that as application in different different domains within Geico, but I'm not aware of any usage of like 911 data or anything like that. Okay. Um, and shifting gears a, a little bit, I know you mentioned Geico is hiring, and I think I saw LinkedIn roles working with telematics data. Um, but as you're starting to evaluate candidates, I'm curious, what experience are you looking for? Um, what are those roles? Mm -hmm. So we are interested in hiring across the spectrum. Um, I mean, certainly bringing in uh, more experienced candidates that could come in at a senior level is, is a big focus, but we're also interested in people who are just entering the data science profession. Um, you know, we look for people who have a pretty solid understanding of machine learning fundamentals. So, so they're familiar with various algorithms that kind of understand uh, how they work, what some of the major, you know, hyperparameters are and how to tune them, and what some of that stuff means. Um, that's, I think, a pretty fundamental requirement. Um, we like people to have some experience in working with different data sets, um, whether it's just, you know, SQL experience or if they have experience working in you know, big data ecosystems, that, that would be great as well. Um, beyond that, I honestly, I think it's just really important to have uh, candidates who are enthusiastic 
um, able to think through and solve problems in efficient ways. Uh, so even if you don't have, you know, five years of experience developing in Spark or Python, uh, but you have some baseline knowledge of that, and you know you're really eager and enthusiastic to learn, and you've got a good sense about data, and you're able to frame analytical questions well, and you know create data products that answer those questions. Um, so that those are sort of the core skills that we look for. Um, I'll say most of the people, even at the entry level that we bring in, do have some sort of advanced degree in some STEM related uh, field. Uh, and, and that could vary quite a bit, honestly. I mean, I think there are an increasing number of data analytics or data science programs at the master's level in particular, but you know, we've also brought in some pretty strong candidates who have PhDs in physics or theoretical chemistry or I mean, even as diverse as like music history. Um, so I don't necessarily think there's one path into data science. Um, and we consider our candidates with a diverse range of backgrounds. Great. Uh, Frank, I see you had a, a great question earlier that I wanna make sure we get to around decision-making. Um, would you wanna jump in and ask that one? Uh, sure, I'll try to do it um, quickly. So it was related to your your three buckets of monitoring or um, when Trevor asked, how do you know if your models are, are working or are right? Um, and you had mentioned that in that last, that third bucket, um, we set up monitoring for, for those things as well. And I found it very challenging. You can make predictions statistically, like your bucket number two, hey, things are all good. These are good predictions. You should use them to make decisions trying to capture when those predictions are used as an input to the decision. Um, some, I find that sometimes naturally it can happen where there's a system where there, there's a, a record, but most of the time it is very hard to tell if the predictions are being used. Mm. Um, I come from retail, I'm in the supply chain world. <laughs> a lot of what we do is still manual. Maybe it's different in your world. And if so, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, no, it's an important point. I think the stronger the connection to the between the model prediction and the action, the easier it is to measure. But that's not always the case. I mean, sometimes you're providing guidance or recommendations, and it's still ultimately up to you know the decision maker to factor that in along with you know many other things. And so attributing a specific action to the model can be difficult. Um, I don't know that there's a, an easy answer to that all the time. Some of that can be handled though through good experimental design. So, right. yep. you know, maybe, you know, in your case in retail, maybe there, there's a way of only rolling out a product in a subset of stores and then you compare that to the stores where it's not. So even if you can't go to stores, had access to that prediction and this other group didn't, and you hope that through your experimental design, you've randomized enough uh, for some of the other uh, confounding factors and uh, you're able to draw uh, valid inferences about the impact of that. Um, so I think you just have to think through the experimental design and how you're going to measure that, um, keeping in mind just what the business case is and how the, the prediction is being used. Yeah, for sure. Do, do, does your team, are there, do they do anything? Are they responsible for that? Is there another team that uses your models and then does the experimental design? Um, some of that varies by use case. Uh, in, you know, frankly, the capability and skill set of the teams that we're partnering with, and some of them have you know pretty good analysts that are good at um, you know designing uh, how we're going to measure the impact, and, and they're able to drive some of that reporting independent of us. Um, in some cases, we have to take on more of that as well. Um, so it, it really just kind of depends. depends. For sure. <laughs> 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 Laughing at the uh, yeah. comment, from Trevor. I guess that's. Uh, it's ultimately a good measurement, right? <laughs> <laughs> Joel, how does your team help other teams in Geico improve their knowledge and skills in data science? Good question. Um, I don't think we have explicit mechanisms for that right now. Um, you know, we don't have uh, trainings that we lead for other analyst groups. Might be something we consider as as we kind of expand our organization. Um, but most of that happens, I think, within the context of project teams. You know, we're just by the nature of 
you know, needing to communicate results or communicate how things work to a team that's going to consume the outputs. You have to explain how these things work, how you should interpret them. You know, what does precision mean? What does recall mean? Uh, how do these features relate to the target or you know, stuff like that? So it's, I would say more informal, typically, um, at least the way that we operate. Do you, I mean, aside from training, do you have some sort of like internal community or group where people share different things that they work on or like a Slack channel for people to help each other? Yeah, so um, we use WebEx Teams, which is sort of a Slack clone, I guess, um, or, or like Microsoft Teams, very similar. Uh, that's something that we really uh, adopted during the pandemic, and I think it's actually been a great addition to our workflow. Uh, so we definitely uh, communicate a lot through that and share information um, uh, through different Teams channels. Um, so that's a good avenue. Um, Within our data science organization, we have uh, you know, regular team meetings where different teams are sharing what they're working on. Um, we often uh, you know, get access to different vendor products that you know, we'll organize different calls around. So there's some information sharing there, uh, you know, attending conferences. Um, uh, so I, I guess there's a lot of different mechanisms where people sort of share information or get information from outside groups. Um, that, that we have available at Geico. I probably take some of that for granted, just having always worked at a big company with a lot of resources. Um, so I think it's it's hard for me to sort of appreciate how that might not be available at a smaller company. Yeah, I can imagine there's quite a large group of, of data scientists there. Yeah, I mean, so another example is, um, you know, within our larger department that we sit within, you know, everyone has access to a Coursera subscription. And, you know, there's obviously tons of resources available there to learn whatever you're interested in. So that's another yeah. example. Nice. As we're all kind of thinking about some of the use cases at Geico, um, I see someone asked a question, do you have any public facing applications or is everything that's built only internal? Uh, public facing, well, uh, I would say yes, maybe not directly, but through an integration with one of our front-end applications. Um, and so if you log into geico.com and you try to get a quote, you know, we would have some technology that's impacting that experience. Or if you're, if you're a Geico customer and you're submitting a claim, uh, you'd have technology that would impact your experience there. So maybe not directly, but certainly um, through those application integrations. Awesome. And I, I know as we get to the top of the hour here, I, I just want to ask you, Joel, if people have other like follow-up questions or want to connect you, with you, what's the best way to get connected? Is that LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn would be great. Um, feel free to uh, you know, send a connection request, send me a message, whatever. Be, be happy to follow up and uh, talk to you about what we're doing at Geico or provide any you know, advice based on my experience in, you know, working in data science. Um, feel free to reach out. Great, thank you, Joel. And, and one other question I, I wanted to ask is, I know there's a bunch of people on the call who may be aspiring data science leaders and what feedback would you, or advice would you give to someone hoping to move into a leadership role? Uh, really pay attention to the business, right? Because ultimately you're there to drive business results and um, you know, the technology, the methodologies, the statistics and data science are really interesting. You can dive as deep as you want in, in that area and have a great career um, and, and be fulfilled in that area. But if you want to move into leadership, you need to learn to speak the business language, um, understand the needs of the business that you're trying to serve. And, you know, through that, I think you can be an effective leader and just, um, you know, understand how to bridge the gap between the technology and the business process that can leverage that technology. Because a lot of times, I mean, that, that's honestly a, a very valuable skill because a lot of people are good at the technical side. They can you know, tell you how machine learning algorithms work and how to optimize you know, the different parameters to predict the value, but they can't really relate to a business problem. And then on the other side, there's a lot of business leaders who have a very high level understanding of machine learning or AI, they've read, you know, Harvard Business Review or something like that, but they don't really 
understand it in meaningful terms. So being someone who can bridge that gap, I think is a great way to advance into leadership within data science. Wonderful. And, and I completely agree with Jeffrey, who just said, can you clip that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. I want to just open the open it up to any other questions or anything that I have potentially missed. I'm trying to read through all the, the uh, questions on Slido too. So feel free to jump in if there are any final ones. So I had a last question. This is Trevor again. Um, Joel, do you, so, you know, as a leader, right? Um, do you still get time or do you think it's necessary? And I know it depends on the whole larger or small or the organization is, but do you actually get time to? Trevor, Sorry, I, I think, think the Wi-Fi dropped for just a second there. Do you want to ask? I think I maybe see it in the, I can see it in the chat too. Um, Trevor asked, as a leader, do you still get time to devote to actually building models? Um, so at my level, I don't do any of that professionally, uh, really just don't have the time. Um, sometimes in my free time, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, actually, I'm currently taking a Coursera course right now. So I, you know, I can work that in sometimes in the margins, but professionally, honestly, just don't have the time for it. Um, so that, I mean, that's, I think one of the choices you make uh, when you decide to go into data science leadership versus, you know, being a senior technical contributor or something like that is you you, you recognize that your hands-on time is going to diminish the, the higher that you uh, advance. But I think it's important to um, invest enough in at least understanding the technologies. I mean, data science is a rapidly developing space. Uh, technologies, platforms, tools, methodologies are always moving. I think as a leader, you need to invest enough of your time to understand how to make good decisions um, in your job and how to utilize those technologies, where to invest in, in those sorts of things um, to do that well. So you can't completely, you know, ignore what's going on. I think you have to maintain some connection um, uh, to some of the lower level details. Um, so it's a balancing act. Thank you, Joel. And I know we are a little bit past the hour. So there's a few other questions, but I want to be conscious of your time too. So see if you have a few more minutes or to run. Uh, I do have to run, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but like I said, if you want to follow up with me on LinkedIn, I'd be happy to you know, extend the conversation there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joel, for your time. Really appreciate all the insights and Hoping, hopefully we'll see you back on one of these in the future too. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining.